Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today my guest is Dr. Lee Cronin. But before that, a couple housekeeping items. If you're a regular listener, you may have noticed that the name of the podcast has changed from Good Chemistry to the Mind and Matter Podcast. While this may be a minor nuisance for some of you that have been listening for a while, I had good reasons for the change, and the most important thing is that nothing else about the podcast is changing. I will continue producing discussions on a wide range of science-related topics, especially in my core areas of interest, which tend to be things like how psychoactive drugs affect the mind and the brain, the biochemistry of life, and how emerging biotechnologies interact with it, as well as questions in the general area of cognitive science, including how brains give rise to perception behavior, and mental phenomena generally. For today's episode, I spoke to Dr. Lee Cronin. Lee is a chemist from the University of Glasgow in the UK. His scientific work focuses on the chemistry of complexity, especially as it relates to the origin of life and our ability to detect signatures of life in the universe. We discussed a variety of topics related to the question of what life is, how and where it arises, and this included discussion of assembly theory, which is a framework that Lee and other scientists have been working on to better understand what life is, how to find it elsewhere in the universe, and even how to create it in the lab. We also touched on how some of some of these things connect with ideas related to information and consciousness. It was one of the more interesting discussions I think I've had so far on the podcast. And as always, if you enjoy the content you hear, please like, share, and subscribe. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Lee Cronin. Professor Lee Cronin, thank you for joining me. It's great to be here. Can you do a brief intro for people in terms of who you are and what you do at a very high level. Yeah, I'm an academic at the University of Glasgow in a school of chemistry. Um, although uh, I'm trained as a chemist, um, but really I would say that I'm um, a theoretician that can only do theory by doing experiment, which it seems a bit weird. And my medium of choice through happenstance happens to be chemistry and stuff I can touch. And I'm interested in control of matter um, from the top down and like human beings and how life got going. So from the bottom up and um, how information gets processed in the universe. Interesting. So you do a lot of theoretical work. You do a lot of chemistry work. And I want to get into some of that, but a lot of it does center on this very broad, very deep question of what is life. And mm -hmm. I thought maybe we could start by having you maybe paint a brief picture for people of the intellectual history of this question. Who, who are some of the major thinkers and ideas that have grappled with this question that have perhaps influenced your own thinking? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. I mean, it goes back to antiquity, right? When people were trying to figure out what, you know, the ancient Greeks were thinking, uh, the Bible, of course. So and I won't go to the Bible or the ancient Greeks because I'm, I'm just not a very good scholar of, uh, of uh, ancient history. But I would say that in terms of who have influenced me, I think that um, I was incredibly, I've been influenced by, um, I suppose, Charles Darwin. If you read his book, it is really interesting the way he kind of, this, 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 th this thing that's evolution just becomes self-evident after, after a while. I think some physicists have influenced me in terms of um, uh, Schrodinger, uh, Einstein. Schrodinger is a bit, bit more curious because he thought that he understood what an unsolved problem of life is. And then I suppose coming on to today, um, Freeman Dyson, I found really inspiring. A very interesting lady at the Weizmann who's still alive and kicking, Adion Arf, who she got the crystal structure of the ribosome. Um, she has influenced my thinking a lot. Um, um, Sarah Walker, ASU, Arizona State University, has influenced my thinking on um, that life is more than just stuff. There's something else, but it's not magical. It has to do with information or what we might call information. Yeah, there's lots of, um, I suppose, Newton, actually, for just being 
basically um, very odd person, clearly very lonely intellectually, and just playing around with reality and himself. And I think that um, you know Newton kind of is an out al- was an alchemist who happened to do some physics. Uh, uh, but he was a pretty nasty person by if you look at the history book so he did him he has influenced me um not because of his nastiness but just because of his um the way, way he framed it you know and so yeah but in really right now there's a lot of interesting people um interested in this problem but they are all i would say um not seeing the elephant in the room if and maybe we don't either or the or the life in the universe And so I want to maybe start to talk about what, maybe let's talk about first what all life forms have in common on earth. So what are the core features of life as we know it on earth? And how does that maybe tie into how you start to think about how life arose? Yeah. So let's start from a very basic materialistic point of view. Um, All life on earth, um, as we look at it, it has carbon in it. Um, so if you were, so uh, that's one thing. There are common elements. So I think you could say, you know, I have my periodic table uh, mug here. So, uh, um, so you know, having carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus, and some chlorine um, is important. But I think that if you were looking at life on Earth from a, as a, from a naturalist point of view, and you had a microscope and you had a video camera you would be able to say a number of things about life is that some things move around and, and some things don't. But if you look at the things under the microscope, you can see a cellular structure. And if you're fast enough to capture the things that moved around, you would also find they have a cellular structure. And if you looked at seawater or even river water or anything, and you looked in the microscope, you would see cells. So that you would, I suppose, uh, just from uh, looking through your eyes, you'd say, well, there's stuff going on. There's these things that look like capsules or packets or whatever and they appear to be doing stuff so i think that that is kind of the starting point isn't it from a very phenomenological point of view that life appears to be these things and if you um, wait some time these things move divide um and appear to to, like they're warm right they they give off uh, heat so and if you take away uh, the fuel or what we might call fuel they no longer give off heat and they no longer move and they no longer replicate. So there's something odd going on with this matter. This thing is able to autonomously wander around and take resources from the environment that doesn't look like itself and then manufacture more of itself. And if you think about it like that, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, just the basic idea that you've got matter and it's got a particular shape essentially. And somehow it's reproducing itself. It's causing more stuff to look like it. Um, You've talked in some talks online about this notion of selfish matter, just sort of generalizing the the term, the famous phrase from biology that there's a selfish gene, that genes are these sort of units of replication, perhaps the smallest units of replication. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your idea of selfish matter and whether or not genes are the smallest unit of replication or, or what the smallest unit uh, of replication might actually be in principle? Yeah, I think so. Selfish matter is a good one. And also, I mean, not just selfish, but in, you know, some matter is lucky because it's animated, right? It gets to go places other matter doesn't go. And just to give you a segue before I answer that question, I always, I wasn't really that fascinated with biology growing up. I was fascinated with physics and chemistry and mathematics and computers. But now and then, when I stop and look, and I look at a wall, and there's a piece of grass or something growing out of it, and you think, and you know what's there, right? This replicating machinery, this ribosome just growing there. You just, for me, it's like a source of wonder that I'm. I don't think I'm ever going to shake. It is so incredibly interesting that there are ways that that life is kind of characterized by these little capsules of matter that are minimally. You know, they're islands in their own right. They can go away and just terraform their surroundings. Mm. So, so yeah, going to uh, selfish matter, I suppose that all ma- if you think about what evolution is doing, um, and I suppose that by calling it selfish, I'm anthropomorphizing. And I suppose actually it's not selfish matter. There happens to be matter that's able in the current environmental conditions to be successful 
And what, what and we don't even know that's anthropomorphizing. So what are you meaning is to say selfish, successful, we can't do that. Okay, let's say persistent. Well, persistent is kind of okay, just there and able to reproduce itself. And so what you do is you go from this selfish to this kind of um um, um functional um object, and you can start to realize that through time this matter is able to maintain its form, repair itself and reproduce and so there is some processing going on and i think it's fascinating that that then that where that matter is if you almost acts like a singularity in space where it's drawing fuel and stuff through that point and something's happening in that point there's some information that there was something going on where it's able to take this dead stuff and literally you know make make living soul of it so actually i shouldn't say living soul we know what I mean. give it the essence of life right and we don't know what that we didn't know what that was hundreds of years ago we now know what that is in terms of you know producing cells and in those cells there's dna and rna and stuff so that's kind of my notion is that you have this um inanimate stuff which has maybe some chemical wealth to it it's got the right bonds that you need the right elements and then i can procure that and extract resources and those resources i can use to build more of myself and to also kind of do something interesting well, i've got you know i've got this resource i'm going to consume this resource i'm going to metabolize it build with it but then when i go through the process of replication i'm going to allow there to be not a faithful well, all i'm going to do is the best i can at making a proper copy but if some errors come in i'm going to tolerate that because maybe those errors will act as a probabilistic program to make my my new offspring better fitter more um able to survive in the environment that may or may not be changing and so you have this really interesting search algorithm that animated matter with selection is able to basically record what's going on in the environment over time and and that may be argumentative be argumentative it might be the all animate matter you know, if you pick one of your atoms, that's animate. So at what level does that atom become animated uh, so rather than inanimate? Well, it's in the network of surrounding objects. So that's a rather complex answer to the question, but I think it provides us a lot of points to get in, dig in and really explore what we mean by the living state. Because if I took one of you know one of your carbon atoms and ran away with it, that wouldn't you wouldn't be that unhappy because there's you have a lot of carbon atoms. Um, so we know that the life isn't just in the atom, it's in some other aspect. And I love to play games with chemists and biologists and physicists and say, well, you know, if we all agree that's the same atom, where is, where is the life? Mm -hmm. What, what is the importance? It's, it seems like one of the most important features of these self-replicating patterns that we call life is their encapsulation that there is a cell, there's a separation of an internal environment from the external environment. Could you speak a little bit about just some of the basic biology there for people who might not know about you know, lipid bilayers and things? And, and what do you think the importance is of having that, that bilayer or that, that cell that separates an internal from an external environment? And is that strictly necessary? Yeah, so it kind of also amplifies what you're saying in the last question. I realized I didn't answer entirely like the, mo the minimal unit of, uh, of uh, life. And, and so you, you suggested, is it a gene? And, um, and let me answer. So let me just carry on and then go on to the cell. So um, a gene is not a minimal unit of life, actually. It's not the minimum thing that's selected upon that people. It is a unit. But as you're alluding to right now, um, objects, molecules are not um, alive. Um, genes are not alive. Um, it may look like they're alive. I can, as a biotechnologist, I could evolve that gene in a laboratory. Is that the minimum unit? No, because the gene needs me to be enslaved to it, moving my syringes around, doing stuff. So then you're like, oh gosh. So if the, the, if the gene isn't selfish, what really is selfish? And I think that then what we've got to do is zoom out and say, what is the minimal viable unit of biology on earth and that's what you've just kind of said well you know what, what, what let's talk about a cell so a cell is uh, so what is it let's say the minimum viable unit in biology appears to be a cell and what is a cell a cell is literally an object which has an in which has an inside which is to some degree protected from the outside world so what does that mean 
Well, that means the contents of the inside has a, a fairly good memory. A cell is a bit like a book, but it's a bit more than a book because a book, a reader has to come and read it, but the cell can read it. So the, a book, um, a cell is a book that can read itself. You see what I mean? So you have the contents of the book. And if the book could read itself and then act on it with the information, then suddenly that's what a cell can do. And so, and the reason why the cell needs a boundary, so it could be a lipid bilayer. And a lipid bilayer uh, is simply a bit of soap, if you like. There's a head and there's a tail. And the water-loving uh, heads will basically gather together to make a kind of make one type of leaflet or they'll do go the other way around depending on whether you've got reverse micelle or or, or micelle and and the greasy part will just form this lovely layer and so it will act as a barrier between the inside and the outside but not only does it act as a barrier it allows some movement of stuff from the outside world to the inside world and the inside of the cell has an elaborate control mechanism which has been involved to basically respond to the outside world, but not too quickly, um, so you can get stuff in and out. So really, the cell is the most minimal viable unit of, of, of evolution. But it's not quite that, because not everything can survive, and it's all a bit on its own. Because what I mean is, if I had an individual cell, is it viable? Yes, but maybe you need to give it some amino acids. Maybe it needs some oxygen. Maybe it needs some CO2. Maybe it needs some sugar. Where does that come from? And then you start kind of getting in this really weird mind bending. Well, what is the minimal unit? And then, and then you come to the conclusion, well, there is no minimal unit, but there are different types of object which are more autonomous than others. So a bacterial cell is very autonomous on earth. It can go anywhere, find food, viruses, are not so autonomous. They have to get in the cell to do their thing. And, and I think that the cell is characterized by a number of objects. So I'm actually answering your questions because I realize I go off at tangents each time. So there is some genetic material in the cell, which is uh, you know explicitly written down and in, in, in something we would call a code. People claim it's a digital code. I don't think it actually is, but hmm. okay, we can talk about what that means. There is a metabolism that goes on, which is able to basically provide, um, open up and close ion channels. There's literally um, a pump. I should view the cell a bit like a um, one of those bouncy castles that you have to have a pump keeping blowing up <laughs> so the kids are happy. And basically for the bouncy castle to remain viable, you have a pump that's blowing air into it continuously. So a cell is a bit like a bouncy castle. It remains inflated, but as long as the machinery is keeping inflated and, and that requires glucose or some kind of sugar. So you've got, so you've got, you need to be inflated. There needs to be ions going in. There needs to be raw materials going in. And then the cells also responding to signals from the outside. And then as a response to signals from the outside, it may change its internal mechanism. So it may go defensive or it may start to say, hey, there's plenty of food. I'm going to replicate now. So I'm going to make another copy of me because times are good and why not? That's what, you know, that's what's supposed to happen. And it will make a copy of itself. It may be that it's a liver cell. So if it was an organ in me, it would be, it got a drug to detoxify. It would do its job as a liver, as a liver do, which would detoxify that, make it water soluble and do its thing. So I think that the cell really has a role in its, um, in the function. And there's also a support system to keep that cell viable so it can repair itself as well or copy itself. So they're kind of all the different things that can happen. But the interesting thing is the life cycle of the cell. The cell, when it copies itself, that process in populations where, is where you read information from the environment into the cells. The cell very slowly learns about the environment over time. And that's kind of the mechanism um, of evolution that we can discuss. And how closely how closely tied to the notion of, of what it is for something to be alive is the concept of Darwinian evolution. I think it seems like most modern thinkers today would, would pretty much say that those two things can't be separated, that if something is alive, it is capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Do you, do you view it that way? And how- uh, yeah, I would, I would say that everything alive has come through a causal chain of evolution. Um, or everything that maybe is living. So let's. So my friend Sarah uh, Walker and Michael Lachman wrote a really nice piece called, uh, which is describe, which 
Which is a beautiful piece, but it's still confusing because they talk about life and alive. Um, and I would rather talk about living and evolving. So, you know, I would say to you, all right, Nick, have you got kids? Do you have to intend to have kids? Are you having, you know, and keep and you'd be like, what? So, well, I want to know if you're just simply um, living or if you are evolving. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay. So, the, so really, um, living things are capable of evolving, but not all um, living things have to evolve. There are dead ends, right? In mm-hmm. you know, there are some people that choose not to have children. There are some species that are the product of a union of two other. I always get the donkey and the mule mixed up, but 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 basically, there are some things that are no longer fertile, and therefore, you know, you wouldn't say you have no animal rights for that object. You wouldn't abuse that object more because it was, wasn't capable of evolution any longer. Mm-hmm. You would treat that with the same respect because it's a sentient being of, well, sentient being. Yeah, it's, a, it's a conscious animal, right? Mm-hmm. I have to be very careful with my terminology here. Yeah. So and I think that... So, and I suppose, too, if you think about like the very beginning that, that we'll talk about, the origins of life, there could have been many dead ends that sprung up before something sort of took. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. And so I think that really evolution doesn't care about what is living. It cares about what is evolving. As I said to, as I say to some people um, when I'm playing those, like I said, look, you know, life is difficult. You know, you, we evolve together, you die alone, right? So, you know, and what I mean by that is that um, evolution doesn't really care about your death um, per se, other than your loss to the population. But what evolution does care about is how you contribute to the population in the environment uh, selecting going forward. So obviously the act of death, it can be important because you might release resources, you might do something else. So I think there is this chain. What I'm really interested in this causal chain going back to Luca, where you are acting and that and the information that you've gathered, you push into the future. But you could build artifacts in your life, these podcasts even, right, that they will go on and influence other people right, that would, in a certain way, that they wouldn't have, they may do things as a result of hearing to a podcast that he would not have done otherwise and affect Mm -hmm. the very future of the humanity. And so in a way that we are now transcending, we are above that type of evolution because we're in this technological world where we can communicate in lots of different ways. So evolution is very good for biology, but as far as technology is another layer on top of that, and can have influence, global influence in a different way. So, and technology is alive. It is living. And people don't, and and this is where the integrated information people, when they're talking about consciousness, Mm. confused everybody else because everything conscious. Well, actually, consciousness is also a distributed phenomena that we can talk about uh, later if you want. So it's really important to understand that chain of reasoning and that chain of data. Well, really interesting to me, at some point, we may be able to produce some informational artifacts that we can get off Earth, that we can send to Mars, and then maybe at terraform Mars and put life on Mars. That's got nothing to do with the, the physical, biological causal chain of life on Earth, even though if it wasn't for our us, there would be no Martians. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's going off a totally different tangent, maybe for later. Yeah, I do think I want to circle back to this um, connection, I think, that that maybe many people don't make, but some have, between questions like the origin of life and questions like the origin of mind or consciousness, because there is this replicative quality to mental activity that, that is really interesting to think about by analogy with things like genetic evolution. You mentioned a term that I want to unpack for people though. You mentioned LUCA. And so I'm wondering if you could just describe for people, what is LUCA and why do we think there was one single origin of life for life forms on earth? Yeah, that's good. So let's, let's so let, I'll answer that precisely and I'll tell you what I think. So Luca stands for the last universal common ancestor. And, and it's a really beautiful notion because if you look at all the cells on earth, let's just say all the cells we know of, we look at them and we were able to look inside, we would see some really important things. We all seem to share the same type of building blocks in proteins in, a, in our functional parts in the cell and our memory of the cell in the DNA and RNA. They seem to be quite similar. And obviously there's different sophistication. So some cells have more complex proteins than others. And what you can kind of do is pull all these in a line and kind of infer a kind of tree of life, not, not just taxonomic, taxon, I can't even say, taxonomic, if I can say that, you can, but also genetic. So you can go back. So now you can say, right, you can imagine going back, back, back. It's almost like in, in um, ancestry things you can do now, right? In our 
mitochondrial DNA. We know that our mitochondrial DNA came from our mothers, it came from their mothers and their mothers. And it's a really good way you can use to trace how human beings have moved around the world. So, so we go back and there's less and less and less of us. And you can imagine back just at the origin of life that there is this first cell that springs up that has all these bits and bobs ready. And it just is the seed that gives rise to all of biology. Now, that's a wonder, rather wonderful term, but I don't think there was one Luca. I think that, that I think that's rather, I don't think that's even neat required because I think what we mean on earth is that there's lots of environments on earth, which are kind of similar and there's chemistry that's kind of similar. And there's lots of competition through phases where Luca like objects were coming. And it's almost like, you know, like Luca or the Luca idea is the first expression of global democracy. And that basically everyone's like, oh, I've got this really important, you know, I've got this better RNA than you, but I can die occasionally. And so that doesn't work, right? So there's a catastrophic death. Or I've got this better, I'm going to use 25 amino acids, but I can't encode it properly because the error correction goes. And so there's kind of like, there was all these pre-Luca technologies fighting it out. Mm. And in the end, you it's a bit, you all solve the problem in the same way. It's like, it's, it's like saying there's a Luca was like saying there was only one point where a human being invented fire. Clearly not. Mm. It was just the, the conditions were right. So I think Luca is more of an expression in geological time and chemistry on Earth, where basically the conditions were right for the minimal viable um, cell to emerge. And it might have happened over tens, if not hundreds of years, because you got to the point, say, a little bit of while where suddenly you had, you know, I don't know if you remember video, you, you look young to me, v, you know, had Betamax and VHS fighting it out and which one would survive. And then an arbitrary decision was made and suddenly everyone has adopted the paradigm. So I think that um, LUCA is merely a term that should be given as an umbrella. And I wouldn't be surprised if we find some cells on Earth deep in the Earth's crust that are slightly splitters just before LUCA. And they were mm. like, you know, no, this is our form of biological democracy. We're only going to have this signature. And because they were in a very special niche, isolated from the rest of the earth, they could survive. And it'd be really interesting for us to find those. We are searching, but as of yet, we haven't really found many concrete examples, if any. Mm -hmm. We've kind of found some little bits. So, so I think Luca is really a state of pre-biological democracy I just made that up. Sounds quite good. Um, I'll take a note of that for later. So let me reiterate that to see if I'm following. So you're almost saying, basically the idea of LUCA is essentially, if you just look under the hood and you look at every cell, whether it's an animal cell or a plant cell, there's differences, but they're all basically doing the same basic stuff. We're all using DNA with the same bases. We all have the same core cellular mach machinery and therefore we must be descended from a thing that had those core components. One universal. Also, I was going to say also, though, it is, it is correct to say that using a process of bioinformatics and probability, you can trace for sure in some species the sequence space going back. So you'll know for sure that this species of animal gave rise to this one because mm -hmm. the combinatorial space of genetic code is just too large. I wanted want to just add that in there so, so to mm -hmm. be entirely correct. Got it. And then you're basically also saying that there was certainly at least the potential or the plausibility for a kind of convergent emergence of life. So just yeah. because we we infer this thing called LUCA because the biochemistry is, is very similar aqua, across different life forms present today, it may have simply been that, you know, uh, to use your fire analogy, uh, people, and this happens a lot in evolution, right? Similar constraints in different locations will allow the independent origin mm -hmm. of traits. And so maybe maybe life did originate multiple times, but it merely looks like it came from a single origin because the yeah. same set of constraints were applied at different time points at different places of the earth. Uh, yeah, I, exactly. And I think that not only that, what we might be able to see, if we were able to really play the tape all the way back, mm -hmm. we might find that in our own cells, we have three or four different origin of life it's common, common so our mitochondria probably came from one origin of life. Mm. You know, our, our, our other organelles came from other origins of life and they just got mismatched together. It's a bit like, you know, when people are copying technologies, oh, that's a good idea, I'll steal that here, I'll horizontally transfer it here and here. And probably the, vir the, the, the space of viruses that exists on Earth 
may help us replay that, but the information is so vast, we're going to have to do a lot of computing, a lot of bioinformatics, a lot of sequencing to even get a hint of that. But my guess is that we are not just the sum of one or two origins of life, but many tens, if not hundreds or thousands. Hmm. And so I think related to that notion is the question of how easy it is for life to evolve. Is it you know, you seem to be implying by saying that there could be many origins so that in some sense, it's perhaps more likely than we once thought for life to actually get started. How do you think about the question of uh, how easy it is for inorganic matter to actually become living? Um, so I think it's um, ridiculously easy and we're just looking at it entirely wrongly. I think that the the, so I think the process that we're looking for, I call it is selection. So there's a selection in the universe without before biology, biology speeds it up. And I think selection is as prevalent as gravity, right? Where there's mass, there's gravity. Where there's mass, there's selection. Okay, now you need to think about that in other terms. Say, well, okay, there's no selection going on on the moon. Well, maybe there was, but the selection isn't very productive. So selection needs some processing to go on. Um, but I think that we have missed it and we've been so obsessive about the complexity of life on Earth. We haven't understood the mechanism which gives rise to um, um, the, the information storage of happenstance from the environment that is really what life is. Life is the ability to store what happened in the past, play it again and use that to your advantage to, to basically animate yourself if i was to put it rather crudely so i think that the process of selection everyone says is vastly hard one of my big gambles in my academic career and i love taking them my gamble is the selection the process that gives rise to the origin of life is as common as the process of, that gives rise to planets and black holes and stars so i uh, it must be staring us in the face and i must find it in the lab so would you say that in your view life is in inevitability, that it's sort of just a, a natural uh, yep. extension of the same process of evolution going all the way back to the Big Bang, that it's just simply going to crystallize out of matter if you let mm -hmm. the universe cool down for long enough, basically. Yeah. Uh, the life is merely, I would say, making fun of the physicists today. The physicists today think that physics is this very small field or very big field, but very fundamental you know, forces, behavior, phenomena, and life's like, no, I'm, you know, I can break the laws of physics or I make new laws of physics that are consistent with the old ones. So it's about, I would say, life is like the blockchain of physics. <laughs> the blockchain is like the, uh, is all out there. You can go back to the beginning and understand it and look at all the processes, the proof, putting stuff in there. And what life does is it forks that chain of possibilities and just plays with matter. And I think that that's something that's hiding in plain sight and we just haven't been able to see it. So there will be a revolution, I, I predict, in my lifetime. I'm, I'm trying to start it. Um, I think I, I'm onto something along with a few other colleagues. There's probably only about 20 of them in the world who sit, see this way. And um, that we see that selection is a, a very, very simple thing that happens everywhere. Selection naturally gives rise to evolution. And evolution to be efficient, it just makes cells. On Earth, the most efficient way to make life is to make cells. Now, it might be on other planets where there's higher pressures and densities. There are other ways to do selection. And life looks a little bit different. You know, one of the things that worries me is that we're so off on the causal chain. We're so forked, if you like, from the main, you know, mm -hmm. I, okay, you know, let's use the Bitcoin analogy, the blockchain of matter or physics, that we wouldn't actually recognize other forks. Hmm. So what we've got to try and do is think more um, open-mindedly about what the processes are and then go, oh, maybe that's an alien. We just haven't recognized it before because we're so, we departed from that mode of matter understanding such a long time ago. But I, to answer your question, I think, and there are hints in my own lab that selection is easy to see but we're really at the limits of, of analytical chemistry right now because the way it scales, I'm doing it. And also I'm, I'm fighting a huge amount of bias, not because, and this is not bad bias. This mm -hmm. is not bad. Well, there is, I mean, there's bad bias. What I mean is that 
as a scientist, you're taught by your teachers and you're taught by the literature. So you can call that information or you can call it bias. <laughs> okay. Now, when that basic bias is useful, it's information, right? When that bias is kind of not necessarily proven, it's more a narrative, then it stops you from doing more work. And there is a huge narrative in chemistry about origin of life, which has stopped the field from doing anything for more than 50 years. That's why I do not work in origin of life. I work in artificial life. Hmm. The origin of life is a very good discipline, but it is rife with narrative and ego. Like all science, we all have egos. I mean, I have an ego too, but, I, but my curiosity is a little bit bigger than my ego, just a little bit. <laughs> and, but that's not maybe the case for all areas of science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hinted at something that I think we'll return to, which is, you know, in order to remove certain biases in terms of how you would identify signatures of alien life, say, one would want a technique that is completely agnostic about mm -hmm. the mechanics of that life. You want to sort of just see, see some afterglow or after effective life, no matter what it actually looks like. Before we get to that stuff, I wanted you to riff a little bit more on... What are some of the major hypotheses that people take seriously today about the kinds of environments on Earth, either now or in the past, where life might most plausibly have arisen? So things like deep sea vents and things like this. Are there, is there a sort of a short list of candidate terrestrial environments for where we think life may have arisen? Sure. There's a short list as long as the, the kind of the individual cults, if you like, in the field, right? But, the, the, but let's try and be as agnostic as possible. So Darwin's warm pond seems quite good. Um, under the ocean at deep sea vents seems quite good. People are fascinated by these, um, these volcanic growths under uh, where you've got the, these black smokers, these chimneys where you've got rocks and porous materials and high temperature and all sorts of stuff happening. Um, you could imagine life occurring in aerosols in the air i mean it's harder to believe but you know it could even occur in ice um there are some people who've seen that you can have interesting chemistry going on in ice so you have these environmental constraints so in the sea on 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 the earth um in a cave lo there's lots of these conjectures but people say oh no no there was there's no possible on the earth because there was no there was you know it had to happen in the sea because all the earth was uh, you know covered in this in this in water or whatever and then you have all these other things going on so it's very difficult you know you can pick your hypothesis but what then happens away from these environments and then breaks into various chemical hypotheses where you'll people say the rna world which is the hypothesis that the 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 chemistry produced the building blocks of rna and these could self-assemble in some way and because rna can act as a functional molecule can do stuff as well as store information, you got two purposes for the for the price of one, and RNA was the you know did something special. Some people think that lipids came first, and that somehow you had lip that you had this lipid world. Some people think that proteins came first, and so and some people think that chiral molecules came first. So chiral molecules are molecules that have a hand, they're left handed or right handed, and a chiral molecule is we've got two identical molecules and you can't superimpose them. They're the enantiomers, so it's a bit. So there is a whole bunch of them, and and actually it's quite funny because people like to argue about which one is the most prebiotically plausible, hmm. and um, and uh, I find that very amusing because of the prebiotically plausible is like well it's like a lawyer right you know trying to go to the Supreme Court and say well I'm going to demand precedent here what do you think and then it keeps changing so there's lots so that I would say there's three or four environmental hypotheses. Okay, on ice grains as well, by the way, in crystals, in rocks, there's three or four chemical hypotheses, and then there's a mixture of all of those together. So there's really a lot of scenarios, it sounds like, and you know, it could be any one or all of the above. What about a slightly different question, which is if you sort of give us maybe a, a very abridged chemistry 101 education, if we're thinking about the periodic table, how much constraint is there on the kinds of chemistry that could even conceivably result in life? So obviously we've got carbon-based life here on Earth. People often speculate about silicon-based life because silicon is similar to carbon in certain ways. I imagine there's actually uh, a relatively small space of 
elemental possibilities in terms of which atoms could actually serve as that kind of backbone of life. How, how should we think about this and how it relates to the question of um, how alien alien life would actually be and how, yeah. how, how it might have similar, similar chemistry? You, you, I think if we can go all the way back, you need, so, I mean, as long as you can prescri- describe a configuration in matter, you might have the possibility for evolution. I'm not saying you're going to get life ne- living neutron stars. That doesn't seem very plausible. We can't store enough bits. So I guess what I'm, I'm pulling back a bit because I just don't know. I'm a really poor chemist. I only know about the chemistry of life on Earth. Why? Where's my bias come from? My bias has come from one atmosphere, one bar, uh, one atmosphere, 25 degrees C, okay? You know, 298 Kelvin. And then the composition of material I find around me on Earth. And so all I would merely say at the moment is that chemist- the life biology on Earth is merely a reflection of the chemistry that was available at the origin of life and also could provide us with the right evolutionary dynamic. So, um, and this is about available matter. Now you look up in our solar system and say, well, Mars, Mars looks like, you know, a red planet. It's maybe lots of iron, lots of inorganic stuff. Doesn't look very alive. Ergo, iron is not very good for life. We just don't know enough about the environmental conditions and how life, how fragile life is in that regard about radically changing environments. It could be that life is a phenomena that is coupled to an planetary environment. And as long as that environment is stable for a long enough period of time, you get this, you get a homeostasis on the planetary scale. And then as soon as the planet flips out for some reason, so Mars lost its atmosphere because the sun just stripped it away. It had no magnetosphere. And there's no plate tectonics or anything like that. But basically life just naturally died. Um, and so, um, but that's kind of one take. If you look at the periodic table, Go at your planet of choice. The element, if you've got elements that are, um, that are abundant, that are capable of covalent bonds, and you've got reasonable temperature and reasonable pressure, then carbon is good because it just it is able to form molecules that can store information easily. But I can imagine all sorts of other things under pressure. I mean, gosh, what what could a chemist do under two hundred atmospheres and a lot of temperature? They could make all sorts of phosphorus, oxygen phosphorus, boron, you know, uh, what we call main group compounds. You could make you could make interesting compounds with metals and hydrogen. It, we just don't know. And Titan, that people are going, we're going to go to Titan in a few years. That's interesting because it's cold. There's lots of liquid alkane there. And gosh, what could happen in liquid alkane? Well, you might use a different type of very weak bonding, not strong carbon-carbon bonds, but bonds that we would call supramolecular interactions. So you might just have these kind of very weak bonds that could maybe allow an evolutionary dynamic to occur. So it really, I would say two things about the, the limitation on life. You need elements and you need configurations and you need where there's bonding, there's hope. So what I mean when I say a life, when there are bonds, there's hope. I don't care how strong the bonds are. If the bonds are really weak, but the planet's really cold, knock yourself out. You can still have life. If the planet's really hot, but the bonds are really strong, knock yourself out. You can still have life. We should stop obsessing about our Goldilocks zone because our Goldilocks zone is uh, anthropomorphized just by us. So it sounds like you would actually say that, um, you know, traditionally when we think about the search for life elsewhere, people are looking for exoplanets, Earth-like planets that have the environment that's like ours. But it sounds like you're saying that we should even be much more open-minded than that, that in a completely different environment, chemically speaking, you could have chemistries that give rise to life potentially that we would think of as terrible for, for giving rise to life in the context on Earth. But different temperatures, different pressures could allow for the use of other atoms to just to do things that are almost unthinkable if we're, if we're not, uh, if we're not thinking outside the box or outside the planet, literally (laughs) outside PV equals NRT. We just got to, we just got to step out of that. I think it's fascinating. I mean, if you think about it, the fascinating thing is you look at, there are only four types of exoplanet. There are dead ones. Um, and that is there ones that maybe will always be dead, but let's know that it's not, let's, let's not say all exoplanets, Let's say all exoplanets have the right to life one day, but let's just don't know. There's dead ones, there's living ones, there's ones that are technological, and there are ones that were once living but now dead. If you think about it, there's only four types of exoplanet out there. 
So when you look at these exoplanets, they fit into one of those four categories. So we should start thinking about them being in those four categories and try and statistically map them with that in mind. Let's stop worrying about whether we exist or not. Let's pretend that out of all the exoplanets we see, they're in one of those categories. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't mean that there are other categories, I suppose you could have like pre-life, but you know what I mean. Broadly speaking, dead, alive, technological, um, always dead or dead so far. I think that's a good set. In terms of the origin of life on earth, the, the story that you typically hear in like middle school or high school biology in the U S is the Yuri Miller experiment where essentially you just take a soup of stuff, you zap it with electricity or whatever, and you look to see, do you get living things swimming around in there more or less? Can you describe that for people who don't know it and and maybe start to talk about today experiments that you're doing or other people are doing where, you know, are, are people doing modern day Yuri Miller experiments to try and create yeah, life? We are. In my lab, I keep trying to, forgive the pun, kill the experiment, but it keeps living. Uh, I'll tell you why in a moment. So the Miller-Yuri is a really simple experiment. Say, hey, we're going to take a, a reaction. Uh, so, say, so take some gas and some water. So we'll take, let me see if I can remember. Ammonia, so that's NH3, so a source of nitrogen. Hydrogen, H2, H2O, and methane, CH4. Okay, and we'll put them all together. We'll have a couple of tungsten electrodes, and the tungsten electrodes actually, which I think is quite interesting. And we'll put, add 50 kV to those electrodes, and this spark will go across and be refluxing. Refluxing means to boil. So you've all this stuff boiling up and condensing around past electrodes, and there's a cycle. So it's a natural kind of the stuff boils, goes up. As it falls down, it falls through the electrodes, gets zapped on its way down. And, and you make, basically, you just give it enough energy to make any old crap. If you forgive the, I don't know if you want swearing on the podcast, but there's not too much more other than that. So, so you make this stuff. And um, after some time, the, the solution changes color. Miller and Yuri, Miller, uh, Miller Yuri did this. And... Um, and after a few days, they were surprised when they, well, maybe a few weeks, actually, they took it out and they analyzed and they found evidence of amino acids. But, you know, in a way, I was like, it's kind of like, yeah, of course. If you think about it, if you think about glycine, glycine has nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen in it. You've just taken a source of these and you've blasted them together. It's very simple molecule. It's easy to imagine. And yes, they made everything else as well. Really simple. It's like a combinatorial uh, kind of card game, you know. Um, so, but at the time it was a seminal experiment. It got lots of people excited, but it, what it didn't do is it didn't produce any complexity. It mm. just cracked open um, the gases and made some organic molecules and combinatorially. So it's just a bit like literally if you, if you're one of these people who likes to make, I don't know, cars or yachts out of matchsticks, um, or you've got your matchsticks and put them together and they clumped into like twos and threes, maybe four or five. No, there's no car. No yacht, nothing, just boring matchsticks come together. So then people worked on it a bit more sophisticated to try and get more stuff to happen. Um, and they didn't really see much more. There was even a paper where everyone was so desperate to see more, they reanalyzed the old samples 50 years on with modern technology. And you know what they found? Wait for it, you're sitting down. They found more amino acids. I mean, I was like, no shit, Sherlock. Of course you could find more amino acids. I mean, it's a combinatorial explosion. Do you not understand and but you know it's a question of uh, um, lack of ideas. So what was missing in the Miller-Urey was selection. It was just a glass bulb, right? So what I've been trying to do in my in my lab is to say, hey guys, let's now put some inorganic Earth's crust in it. Well, the first one we did actually is um, Miller and Urey. And uh, Urey actually got the Nobel Prize, but he got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, and. Um, and so I, I thought it would be hilarious just to m make fun of the community to do the Miller-Urey experiment, but do deuterate it. Say, so what happens on planet Deuteron? And my group were like, really? I was like, come on, let's just buy some D2O. That's heavy water and do it. But when we did it, we got different results. What we showed is when the water was heavier, you basically, they, they move around in a different way, different speeds, and you get different compounds, which was mind blowing, obvious to me afterwards but before i was like oh okay yeah you change the weight of the stuff you have different isotopes you have different compounds so that was quite humble and quite great so we did that 
And what we're doing now is we're trying to put different amounts of the Earth's crust in and say, if we have Earth's crust and we can vary it, can we start to go from the soup that's unsculpted, just a mess, and can the minerals select, the crystals select some of the soup and trap that somehow and select it over time? And we're seeing evidence of that. Uh, I think we've seen the first evidence of environmental selection in a Miller-Urey type experiment. Um, we're moving away from it because we're doing more sophisticated ones, but that's kind of where we are. There are other people doing Miller-Urey's as well, similar lines, but um, but maybe um, they they have a different angle where they may be changing some of the chemistry or some of the pressure or something like that. So I know that this isn't um, a precise question, but is it your intuition that, you know, in terms of the ability to create life, literally someone in a lab somewhere creating life in a beaker, is that something that, that you view as relatively plausible in the sense that it could very well happen within, say, our lifetimes? Or how do you sort of think about the probability there? Do, do you go into the lab every morning wondering, is today the day where I walk in and, and there's something swimming around in there? Um, I, I want to, but it's a big sociological problem with PhD students trying to get them to do these experiments because uh, it's kind of, um, I think it's, I thought it was going to be easy to make a simple life form in the lab. And it hasn't that been, hasn't been that easy, not because it's that hard, but because doing long-term experiments is difficult to set up. We have to set up all the technology. We're building almost like a large Hadron Collider for origin of life right now. and so. Now, if you say that, oh, no, your life form must have a ribosome, how long would that take? I'll say, well, probably as long as it took for life on Earth, you know, maybe mm -hmm. a few hundred thousand, few million years, because the ribosome is complicated. It's only so much time, you know, the information, you can almost calculate how much time it would take on a causal chain, which I'm doing right now, actually, which is one of the reasons why I was inspired by Ada Yonaf. And um, I think thanks to her discovery, and we can count the subunits, and the, I think I know how long it takes to or how many selection steps you have to go through to make a ribosome in an inorganic world, which is mind blowing. Because then you can work out how much mass, how much time, which is like, gosh. Um, but let's go back to your other point. If you make, so if so, to the quick answer is yes, I expect to make life in, in my lifetime pretty quickly, but I don't think anyone will believe me <laughs> because it's going to be too simple and everyone's going to be arguing about is that life or not. So what I'm trying to do is break the problem down. And what I should do is try and break everyone's expectation down and say, well, look, let's not call it life. Let's call it evidence of selection and increase the sophistication and start to see a place where we can get selection. Um, and then if the system starts to create a crude genetic um, system where you can store information and read it out functionally from nothing, then I think that. I will start to convince people that this is the route to biology. But you can see how that's less satisfying than, you know, putting a load of stuff in a bell jar, Frankenstein moment, turn it on and come back the next day and some blob going, yo, <laughs> hi, yeah, I'm a Cronin, yeah. I'm a Croninite, you know, whatever. <laughs> so thinking about, well, you mentioned briefly something that on the one hand, is pretty intuitive, I think, but but I know that there's there's more to it that you've been working on. This notion of chemical complexity, right? So I think on the one hand, you know, anyone can understand that if a molecule is smaller and has fewer kinds of atoms than another molecule, it's obviously simpler. You can layer on the idea of the the 3D configuration that the molecule has. But can you talk a little bit about the notion of chemical complexity and how that's relating to some of your ideas about how we detect signatures of life, irrespective of the chemistry that that life actually has yeah 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 so in trying to going back to the definition of life i thought i think that everyone was getting their their um kind of literally getting themselves conf overly confused by arguing about what is life everyone would have a new definition right and everyone would have a smarter definition their definition of life and it really i really found the whole thing very amusing and, and a little bit infuriating and i just said well let's not argue about what because people say you know is a flame alive is a virus alive is a politician alive, you know, or, or oh no, that's intelligent or conscious. Pick your, take your pick. And then you, and you get your round a circle where we're arguing about what life may or may not be. And I was like thinking, well, look, what is it that life tends to do and require that makes it different to background processes in physics and chemistry? 
And then you get, you're looking at the sophistication of the molecules and, um, and how big and complex they are. And um, the problem with the word complexity is the mathematical physicists and computer scientists have been making complexity calculators for many, many tens of years. And they're kind of not really, they're really cool abstractly, but they don't really tell us anything about reality because their complexity calculators are complex and not computable. So I found it really infuriating because I went to the mathematicians, I was a chemist willing to cross over into a new field and say, hey, I realize there's a problem in origin of life. We're not counting complexity properly. Can you help? And they went, no, nah, it's, nah, it's boring or we don't care. You're, you're way of doing it. Just use this method. Just use my method. So I went away and I thought, right, I'm a chemist. I know about chemistry. What is it that's interesting? And what I noticed is that um, if you were to do random Miller-Urey type experiments, you get a whole explosion of stuff. Easy. Because it's just the atoms will bond into each other. And I say, okay, how far do I have to go before the molecules become so big, but complex, not big like, but, but not big and just a tar or a mess, but like, and I will say that molecule is not randomly produced. Is it even a worthwhile as a thought experiment? And I played with this for a good couple of years and everyone said, no, no, of course you can get complex random molecules. It just happens by chance. I said, okay. But what about a Tesla? Well, back then, it's probably a jumbo jet. What about a jumbo jet? Is a jumbo jet just a random? No, 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 of course not. A jumbo jet was made by Boeing. It's a jumbo jet. So, okay. All right, then what about protein? They went, well, of course not. A protein is a very complicated molecule made by evolution. I said, okay. So you do agree that there are some molecules that can form that are, are, are. And then people start to say, well, no, even protoid, even some proteins could be formed by chance. We just wouldn't know it's a protein. We were calling protonoids. And so I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I realized that there was this blind spot in mathematics and computing science and chemistry and combinatorics that because I know enough computer science, chemistry, mathematics, and probability theory, I was able to work out that there are indeed um, molecules that um, are so complex they can't form on Earth without the help of life. So I flipped it around another way and said, okay, this ribosome it's not strictly a molecule. Ribosome is a really complicated thing. You can say a molecular ribosome, people will tell you off. This CO2 molecule, which one is most complicated? They want to say, yeah, ribosomes. Great. Say, so, okay, let's go down a bit. Um, this molecule of glucose, is it more complicated than CO2? Sure. But could it rise on its own? Uh, probably. Glucose probably could. So then I said, okay, where's the sliding rule between your CO2 and your ribosome? And I think then you just pick your point where, okay, if I found this molecule, so I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And that's where I started to kind of realize that there was a new theory of complexity. In fact, the first ever theory of complexity in any discipline that is actually computable and measurable. And I was like, because lots of people say, oh no, we can measure complexity, but they can't really, because it's not, it has to go through an observer. It's not objective. They have to make some assumptions. So uh, and it's quite technical for here, but, but we've been playing with that and we realized we came up with a measure of molecular complexity. Now, why is that per count? Well, my hypothesis for life is don't worry about what defining life. Life as a process um, can create complex artifacts in abundance with multiple copies that no other process can do. And that's my working thesis. So it's a bit like a, you know, a bit like a, I don't know, a Rembrandt or a, or a you know, a Van Gogh. You would know the Van Goghs, Van Gogh, whatever. You would say basically, he would, you know, the style. So uh, when you found ten paintings from that, that artist, you know it's from that artist because you recognise the configuration. So that's kind of a quite an elaborate answer to your question, but it's super important because it starts to remove the bias because you don't need to know anything about the chemistry, but we could dig deeper into that in a moment. Mm -hmm. So I do want to try and explain this on a very basic level. And, and this is related to what you're calling assembly theory, this idea that you can quantify quite precisely um, whether or not life is present based on the bouquet of, of molecules that you find you know, somewhere in some environment, and in particular, the, the distribution of complexities that you measure, you know, in that soup of molecules. And when you say complexity and how you quantify it, 
it has something to do with the number of steps that it would take to construct any given molecule from the elemental, you know, Lego building blocks that, that you have at your disposal. Is that accurate? How, how would yeah. you think about it? So what we try to do is uh, to define assembly theory. What assembly theory says, you take a given object, you say, um, let's say take two objects, A and B. If you wanted to basically work out which one was more complex, you would, the one that took takes more steps to make it, and the object is made out of bonds. So you could basically break up all, let's imagine, you take the molecule and you break all the bonds. And then you say, right, I'm allowed to form all these bonds again. What is the minimum number of steps if I'm being super lazy to do it? Now, you go, but what? It would just be equal to the number of bonds in the molecule. Like, but come on, let's take a shortcut. When you've made one type of bond or mo one motif once, you've already got that in your memory. So be like, ah, oh, okay. So suddenly, so I've made, this, I've made this bond once, and if I need it again, I can just pull it out of my bucket. So if I put two bonds or three bonds together and I've got the, that exact shape again, I can do it, but without incurring a penalty other than one step, not the three steps. So that allows you to compress the information into a causal chain of events. It's a bit like if you imagine taking, making a Lego, I don't know, Millennium Falcon or whatever um, Star Wars thing. I like Star Wars at the moment, my son does. You, there are certain boring bits where you just have to add the bricks together and some intricate bit, bits. But when you add the bricks together, that could be in this part or another part, whatever. So you've got that part already at your disposal. So it's a bit like those breaking down. So assembly theory is a probabilistic theory to say, if I took a hammer to my Lego, broke it all apart, it would, it would tell me the worst case scenario, the, or, or sorry, the best case scenario, the minimum number of steps I would need to take to get to that object uh, probabilistically. And that seemed really nice because then that allowed us to then assess a molecule based upon the number of steps to get there. Hmm. So literally, if we were to put this in terms of Legos for people, literally all this is, is... If you look, if you had a tub of Legos, literally Legos, you've got blue ones, you've got red ones, all of the little individual Lego blocks, and you saw a pirate ship built out of Legos, you could say, okay, there's a thousand different ways to put these blocks together to make that pirate ship, but it takes at least X number of steps, 500 steps, say, to put things exactly. together to make the pirate ship. But for a simple you know, rectangle, it only takes three. Therefore, exactly. the pirate ship's more complex. Exactly. So if you were able to see, so the pirate ship, I would say is a clear evidence of life. And then you say, oh, but hang on, there's only one pirate ship. So let's say we look at Mars and you see a pirate ship and you, and, and you, and you go, okay, it could be a one-off. But now the beautiful thing about life and living systems, it doesn't just make one pirate ship. There's zillions of identical pirate ships. So when you say, oh, that's one pirate ship and I can break it down, that's not life. And you say, but hang on, there's, look at my 10 billion pirate ships that are identical. And you're like, whoa. So there has to be the... So there has to be a process that's producing this pirate ship. And each of these steps is that information has to be encoded somewhere because why form the pirate ship? Why not form a racing car, a Lego Santa, whatever? I must say that when I explained this to chemists, the chemist still said, no, um, you, the pirate ship is somehow magic. And it's really interesting how in a discipline, when I was trying to get people socialized to this, they just would not accept the probability theory. They said, there's something special, but I'm like, okay, if I write a book, at what point do you determine the book is written by me and not just a random type keys on typewriter? And so that's different. I'm like, well, okay, but, you know, and it's very interesting to kind of calibrate people into probability space. It's okay if you're a mathematician or a, a statistician, but a chemist somehow believe in magical pirate ships. <laughs> so... When you are calculating these numbers, I want to I want to paint a short picture of how you guys do this for people who are not chemists, and then talk about like how you would actually apply this to search for and find alien life on another planet. So you guys mm -hmm. use mass spectrometry, and you've got a way to calculate this number for any given molecule. Can you just briefly explain for a non-chemist what is mass spec and and basically how does this machine work? Yeah, so if you want, I can take a step back and say, how do you do it for molecules and how mass spec works? And mm -hmm. I think it then fits more naturally. So the pirate ship, we're talking about the Lego bricks coming together. In chemistry, we're talking about bonds holding the atoms together. So when, when you have a bond in a molecule, that bond basically is a, is a specific interaction that when you look at some colors um, um, and you look at heat, you know, when you look at infrared, that's evidence of these bonds moving. Now, 
if you were to take a photograph of some molecules using infrared radiation, you've got lots of different colors coming out. And roughly speaking, each color corresponds to every different bond. So a different bond has a different energy. That means it vibrates at a different place. So the vibrations of the molecule give you the colors. So when, if you have lots of colors associated with one molecule, you know it's more complicated. Count the number of, mole, count the number of color, colors, you get exactly the, complete, the assembly number. Now let's go to mass spec. What does mass spec do? Well, in the particular version of mass spec that I use, mass spec is a way of weighing a molecule. So you put the molecule in the gas phase and you basically have a big electromagnetic field and the molecule moves around a curve and you basically can calculate how massive it is. But there's more to it. What you can then do, is you can then hit the molecule with some uh, uh, energy and the molecule falls apart. And so the number of parts it falls into give you the number of fragments. So if you take a molecule that's really simple, <coughs> excuse me, it could break into two equal parts and you'd only see one part in your mass spec, so you mentioned there's a difference. So the more part, different parts you see, the more complex it is. Now in our mass spec experiment, you don't image one molecule, it's not possible. You have to image many millions at once. You basically select them all so they get partitioned. So you get through your one pirate ship versus a million pirate ships instantly. In the mass spec experiment, what you do is you could always see a minimum of 1,000 pirate ships, 1,000 molecules. So you basically do the mass spec, you see the molecular weights, so you see the peak, the molecule, so it's heavy. So let's take a heavy molecule. Then you hit that heavy molecule, and you know that you've only selected that one molecule. It's a special surgical instrument. And then you count the fragments. And the number of fragments is roughly equal to the assembly number. And so that it sounds really complicated, but it's simply mass spec, sample in, see a molecule, hit the molecule. Does the molecule have more than 15 fragments? If it's more than 15 fragments, looks like it could be from life. So that's really the kind of detector, that the living detector system that we built. So it is really, conceptually, it's as simple as if you took your Lego pirate ship and then you just took a small block of just red Legos that were just red Legos in, in a rectangle and you threw them against the wall, the pirate ship would break into pieces and there'd be more different types of pieces that you'd see because it's more complex. It's got more yeah. components. Yeah, exactly that. And, and you just detect that. So that's, a, that's literally it. I mean, you could also, you, you, the nice thing about assembly theory is you can use it to see if people are cheating. So if you've got someone who's playing cards and you're able to count the number of cards, you could actually see when these motifs come together or when people are writing text, you can see um, because the pattern in the text has a minimum number of steps to make the, you know, the words, you can use it to see if it's got a common origin because the more copies the more conspicuous it is. So, so I'm actually using assembly theory to look for plagiarism because what does life do very well? Plagiarizes itself, hmm. makes copies of itself. And that's all it does. It tells you about those three variables, the, inf the information in there. But yeah, your analogy with breaking up the Lego is perfect. It's spot on. It's exactly how it works. And so it sounds like uh, it's obviously much more complicated uh, than it's going to sound, but you could take a machine like this put it on a Mars rover, put it on a spaceship, send it somewhere, and you could do this type of experiment. And using assembly theory, you could detect whether or not life was present indirectly without having to make any assumptions on what exactly that life looks like. You would simply be looking for the right distribution of highly complex molecules that you see over and over again. Yep. I mean, um, I mean there are mass specs on Mars right now. Sadly, they don't have quite the resolution and quite the ability to hit a single molecule, but but we're sending a mass spec to Titan soon on Dragonfly that what should be. And um, I think it's very easy to imagine an experiment. So NASA have already sent rovers and ships with mass specs. It's gonna be very easy to do it again and modify them and look for life um, agnostically. And what I'm saying is that um, if we are able to find so the, well, the nice thing about the experiment, sorry, is the way that the mass spec, you should view it like a nose. So the mass spec basically draws molecules in to the lungs, if you like, breathes them in from the nose, and the lungs are where the detection occurs. And, um, and you really just have to get sample in the, in the air from space into the, into the mass spec and just work out what you've got. And so what you can do is you can then look at the complexity by sniffing, sniffing the number of fragments and just then follow 
the increasing of complexity to 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 go and look for more more interesting you know the source of molecules and nasa are going to do this now i think they I, it took me a while to convince them of this because at the beginning when i developed the technique they said it was like impossible and then it was ludicrous and now it's obvious so i think they're the three stages of uh, of you know a new idea impossible ludic uh, uh, ludicrous and obvious uh, oh if you see what i mean um um so and that's really exciting because i think we will know for sure um because we have the scale uh we will be able to send the machine to mars to venus um to enceladus to titan to io wherever we want to go and we will be able to detect molecules and if their complexity is high the higher the complexity or the assembly number and notice I use the word assembly and not complexity it's because it's within comparing them within classes, but it's just like, what molecule was the most assembled? How much information did it need um, to get there? And the more information, the more unlikely it is that it came from an abiotic source. And yet, if you're a real skeptic, you can say, I need an assembly number of a thousand. If you're really, um, uh, you know, by going by what we have on earth, an assembly number of 15. If you don't want to be in the middle, you might say 30. And so, and what we're doing right now is checking that, doing the, the measurements in the lab. But the nice thing about it is you do not need to know anything about the chemistry on the planet. You don't need to know anything about the history. It's all self-consistent. There's no assumptions, no labels. Your only assumption is that there are molecules present and that, uh, life, uh, that life can make complex molecules. Mm -hmm. And one of, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask, and I'll still ask it, even though it sounds like you've... Uh, you've sort of switched my my thinking on this. I, I was going to ask how many Earth-like planets are out there because I know that over the years, they've become more and more common. We've discovered more and more. But it sounds like you're saying um, we don't need, we shouldn't be biased to thinking about life must be in a planet that's like Earth. We can actually potentially find it in a very different type of planet. Nonetheless, um, can you give people a sense for how many reasonably Earth-like planets are out there and how common we think this is today? Oh, wow. I mean, off the top of my head, I, don't, I, I mean, the numbers are changing all the time. But actually, I'm gonna, I, I don't think your question is a bad one, because I'll, I'll come to why that is in a moment. Let me ask you a question. So if we can say that most stars that are similar to our sun have solar systems associated with them, and it would be that we see, and there's, say, I don't know, there's a few billion stars in, or at least a few hundred million, if not a few billion stars in the Milky Way, then, and let's just say, let's say, I don't know, let's say 25% of them are like our sun. So let's say a few hundred million. And then a few, and then at least 50% of those have solar systems. And um, when there's a, so those solar systems, let's just say um, another 10% of those could have a, if you're talking about at least 10 million Earths in the Milky Way, if not more. Now, why is that interesting? Why, you, you know, you're pulling back. Well, I, I like the idea of looking for Earths because what I, what I think you mean by Earth water, carbon, um, Goldilocks zone, quite because life on Earth with carbon and this gravity took this trajectory, it might be easier to talk to aliens from an Earth-like planet than aliens from another planet because our metabolism, the time scale on which we're interacting are going to be similar. It might be that life on some other planets may take a you know, few thousand years even to go through a metabolic you know, second for them. It, it just it, it I know it might that might seem insane, but who sets the time constant? Well, the time constant must be set by the reaction rate and what what we you know how we're able to move stuff around at our pressure and temperature. So I would say looking for Earth-like planets is a good idea if we want to find ever, uh, intelligent life that we can communicate with. But I'm just I've just made that up just now in response <laughs> to your self criticism because I think it is a valid question. But I, I mean, I just made up the numbers for Earth, um, but I think I've heard estimates in the Milky Way alone that there are potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of candidate Earths. Um, but that, that's making some pretty you know, wide assumptions. Mm -hmm. And they're going to get narrower. The, the error bars on those will get narrower with observation. Yeah, but for someone like me who... who doesn't really know much about astronomy and these things, you know, we're not talking about a handful. We're talking about a much, no. much higher order of magnitude. Yeah. I mean, and there's, and there's also lots of things about solar system dynamics, right? Everyone said, oh, our solar system is really important because we've got these heavy planets in the outer atmosphere, outer solar system that cleaned up 
everything so earth wasn't bombarded and all this stuff and you know so there's all these kind of everyone's looking at contingent reasons why earth is special in the center of the universe and i i, I don't think that necessarily that's uh, you know um a problem but we need to assess if we are rare um then you know we have to we have to cope with the, the possibility that maybe we are the only intelligent life form in our galaxy but we just don't know enough a couple other topics i'd like to hit in the time remaining one of them is the origin of complex life so mm-hmm. given that life exists you know it took i don't remember how many billion years to go from single celled organisms to multicellular organisms can we think about that transition using the same framework you're using to think about the origins of life? Because, I mean, I would presume that the types of molecular artifacts that a multicellular organism produces are uh, quantifiably more, more complex than the ones that a bacteria produces, say. Do you, do you think about the transition from unicellular to multicellular life at all? And, mm-hmm. and, and is there anything you can say about, about that transition? Yeah, I'm not as negative on it as you are. You, I mean, I would, I, I, I probably shouldn't use the word quite like this because it has negative connotations. But you know, Earth might just be uh, retarded with respect to its ability to go from single cell to multi cell. And what do I mean? I don't mean retarded as a pejorative. I mean, think about it. Our pressure and our temperature required a, a met, uh, inc- an ability to take an information to to kind of change the way we store information in the cell. And then we then took a metabolic change as well because we put oxygen in the atmosphere. But what about if there'd been oxygen in the atmosphere? What about had we already, there was a natural source of oxygen. And so life didn't have to evolve in the absence of oxygen. And so we are kind of, there might be a wind, might be quite a wide window on that. So, you know, it may be that on some planets you can get to intelligence really quickly. On other planets, they're just a bit slower, like I say retarded um, but i mean that from a planetary point of view um and um from an n of equals one you know observations we just can't say anything all we can comment on is like isn't it weird that earth was quite happy you know in one domain until it was tipped into another domain and i think the hint is this you need a changing environment to challenge the life form for it to then kick up a level kick up a level kick up a level so Earth was good in that it was stable enough for life to emerge, but it was too stable for life to make the kick up. Life had to actually pollute the environment for things to happen, which I think is kind of interesting. And maybe people are saying, well, actually, you're you're misevaluating life on Earth. Life on Earth is not, you shouldn't be counting the IQ of life on Earth. You should be counting the ability of life to just form uh, and cope with its environment. And maybe arguably climate change that's coming that everyone's worrying about is going to be another increase in our collective IQ as a species, hmm. because we might have to we have to out evolve it or out technologically compete it. Hmm. Yeah. So I didn't actually think about this before. You're basically saying that you could almost think about a transition in complexity, unicellular to multicellular life, say, as having an activation energy. Yeah. Uh, to borrow a concept from from chemistry, and perhaps. Uh, at, on Earth, we actually had a very high activation energy for multicellular life simply because we didn't have oxygen and other things around. Yeah, yeah. Earth was too, let's, let's not use the negative connotation. Let's say Earth was a bit boring, <laughs> right? And then, and so it took a while um, for things to happen, but maybe there are other planets that maybe smaller have different uh, conditions. And maybe it's the smaller planets that are less boring that get to intelligence quicker because the planet's going to burn out or something's going to happen. And those techn- and you might find a clustering of technological civilizations on Earth-like planets that might be a little bit smaller that have been kicked into that trajectory quicker. But I mean, I've just made this up. It's fun to think about, right? Because I think that we just say, oh, it took this time on Earth, therefore, uh, therefore nothing. We, we don't know anything. All we can say is it's, it's interesting it took this length of time. It could be depressing if we're demanding intelligence to be the pinnacle, but I wouldn't be down on it. I think we just have to be as open-minded as possible in our search. Mm-hmm. And so I guess this is a good place to talk about the, the next stage or the next step up, which is, you know, life starts. That's interesting. It's a very interesting transition. Life goes from relatively simple unicellular to multicellular, also a very interesting transition. And then at some point on earth, you get what we would call minded life, life that is aware. And uh, it's, I'm not going to use the word pinnacle, but it's most complex exemplar is, is ourselves. 
And I'm wondering what your general thoughts are on how deep the connection is between thinking about the problem of life's origins and thinking about the origin of consciousness. I know that, for example, I've had Terrence Deacon on the podcast before, and we didn't really get to this specifically, but someone like him would argue that understanding the origin of life is actually very deeply connected to understanding the origin of consciousness, and it's not merely a kind of metaphor. Do you think a lot about that stage of complexity and and where consciousness comes from? Um, Yes and no. I mean, I think that maybe Terence thinks consciousness is more special than it is. I think consciousness is not really that special per se. There are, well, uh, it is and it isn't. So, uh, but I would agree that I think that the, the, the same transitions in information or the same lack of understanding of physics, of the new physics of chemistry and biology that drives the origin of life is also responsible for, the, the, for consciousness. And I would say origin of life is probably... And a few colleagues, I think Michael Lackman has said this and Sarah Walker and a few others said, said hey, we think that um, the origin of life is the easiest of the hard problems with consciousness being one of the hardest ones. So, yes, I do think they're similar because there's transitions in information, because I think that, you know, we really have no understanding about information in the world. Assembly is that first scraping that says, hey, actually, there is information out there that is not doesn't have to be user dependent doesn't have to go through you as a god it assembles itself when the chain of events can remember what happened it can make another series of steps so the information is within that chain and if you think about it consciousness as a phenomena probably didn't emerge with a single individual it occurred in a network and we then infected each other super important to understand that consciousness probably happened that way and then, and, and that's also about then how life is literally searching space for correlations because all consciousness allows us to do is remember the past, be aware of the present and imagine the future. I mean, imagining the future is one of the biggest hacks that biology's ever made because suddenly I can imagine what would happen if I built a bridge that did this direction or I built a skyscraper or a computer program. These kind of things that then cause material effect in the world liberate me from just evolution i can do many other things and i think that from that degree consciousness is a super important uh, tool for life to be causal in a non-evolutionary or be a little bit above the layer of evolution it doesn't be evolution because it all lives on the layer of evolution but it, it its effect can be faster And so it's really interesting to think about this idea that consciousness is something that we infected each other with, uh, that there was a time when perhaps we had the all of the biological hardware, let's just say, um, that allows us, that sets us up to have the minds we have today, but it wasn't until some kind of social structure or something emerged that you know, what we can refer to as consciousness arose, but it arose in parallel in many locations and sort of spread from person to person, almost yeah. like an actual virus. Do you think that's, um, do you think that's merely a metaphor? So when people start talking about memetics and ideas uh, no. replicating like genes, is there something deeper than a metaphor there? Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's much deeper. In fact, it's the mechanism. The thing is, why would a single, think about it, why would caveman, cavewoman suddenly go, oh, I'm now going to think. That doesn't make any sense. Caveman and cavewoman interacting and trying to, oh, there's food over there. There's danger over there. I'm annoyed because I woke up today and I'm wet because it's raining because I live in Scotland or I'm too hot because I'm living in this, I don't whatever, right? It, consciousness had to be driven by utility. You know, these things don't just spring out and utility is communication. So communication, now it doesn't mean that self-awareness, self-awareness is always there, but consciousness, what I mean by abstraction, the ability to then start labeling things and so on. And that was kind of must have collectively emerged. And also I think it did shape the hardware. There was a minimal hardware where you could start and then that we, we selected. So the ability for us to now create memes was entirely evolved. Um, and so I know I don't think that's loose at all. I think we, we need to pay attention to it. It's really important. That's why one of the things I keep saying to people about origin of life, why do we care? Well, if you want to understand where humanity is going on Earth, we need to understand the origin of life because we don't know what life is yet. Until we understand what life is and how the causal chain and the information flowing from that 
process till now, can we even begin to shape the future and say, even understand, I, I would even try to convince people to understand social media today and the evolution of social media. We need to understand the origin of life. And one of the things I'm trying to invent is like a future Twitter or counterfactual Twitter. I'm going to make a Twitter that's basically two months older, like that's the universe in two months time interrogate that and use it to basically go back in time and seed Twitter now and have this link um, uh, to, to and I, it may seem insane, but it's not. It's about understanding how at these social levels you get acting down on the biochemistry and it comes up again. So there's a process of causation that goes in all directions, but there is one directionality by time. It's just about layers of, of abstraction. Yeah, it's almost in some sense easier for me to think about. So, so if we come back to this um, notion of how important selection is, it's almost easier to think about selection at this higher level of the mind because we have to communicate with each other. And there's a very natural selection process that's determined by whether or not we effectively exchange our verbal communication in order to do something. And obviously, we either do it or we don't. Earlier, you touched on something that we didn't go fully into, I don't think, which is the imposition of selection by the physical environment in sediments or the earth's crust, say, that you're using to do some of your origin of life experiments. Can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between selection or how how selection happens at the level of life's origins and what that has to do with the physical constraints of the environment? Yeah, so that's a, that is the question. I think when we understand this, we understand consciousness, which is kind of a bizarre statement to make. So really, at the so first of all, I should say that um, I have some very strange views of time in the universe and the way that determinism works. I'm going to compact a huge amount into about three minutes, which will probably need about three zillion podcasts if you're interested at some point in the future. But the first point is, I'm a determinist, and I, I, the universe had to be deterministic for life to even emerge. Now, it doesn't mean I don't believe in well. There's no free will, but it doesn't mean I don't. But I do believe there is an unwritten future. Physicists are kind of determinists and they think the future is written and it's not. And I'll explain why that is in a moment, but I need determinism to work even at the quantum level, even in the quantum realm, because there needs to be cause and effect. You don't have cause and effect, you don't have selection. So that's the point number one. You have some kind of physical laws or some kind of inter interactions happen. To happen that, there happens to be one hour of time. So time is not merely an add-on. Time is more fundamental than space. The beginning of the universe, there was time. That time created space. Now, let's just leave that behind because you don't need to worry about that. It just helps you understand the causal structure. So you have time creating, and there are events happening in that time, and say, boulders bunching into one another. So let's go now to the origin of life and geology. So you've got some, so you've got, you know, you have the Big Bang, create stuff, stuff crystallizes into matter, matter crystallizes into stars. Stars explode, create planets. Planets have inorganic stuff on them. That's all kind of determined from the, you know, from the Big Bang, right? Okay, there's obviously undetermined things, but life does something to determine in terms of states available. This is what it really makes us really is about to fry your brain if it hasn't already. That basically the universe is relatively deterministic but complex. But what life starts to do is to imagine itself an abstraction space. So there is like this greater possibility through selection than the universe could get. So the reason why the universe is not deterministic is because of selection. And this is why I think we have to understand selection goes all the way back to the Big Bang. So what do I mean? If you've got a series of interacting particles, you could estimate what's going to happen in the future, the base of what's happened in the past. There is no causal structure there. It's just laws. But if you suddenly have selection, where, where that selection is kind of contained, there's a bubble of, of, you know, that follows around the particle, that bubble, selection bubble, then suddenly things become much more undetermined because there's so many interactions. And you can then see the objects. Let's just now, sound eight, let's now go to the crystal world. I've got a crystal with a Miller-Urey. Miller-Urey is just random gunk. But the crystal has an ordered face. So suddenly this random gunk sits on the crystal and doing random interactions, but makes a molecule magically, well, not magically, probabilistically, but that molecule happens to be a, a catalyst for itself. So suddenly a self-replicating molecule gets made on that crystal randomly. 
And there's more stuff and it comes in and this molecule goes, hey, I'm quite good at making myself. I'm now making myself. Well, hey, look at you. Before you know it, all the gunk has been turned to this molecule. And in that process, maybe the molecule makes another accident, goes into another crystal, and it makes another version of itself with another atom on. It goes, hey, I've now made another one of myself, but I've got an extra atom on than I had before. And this carries on and carries on and carries on. Before you know it, you have a molecule with such complexity, high assembly number, can't have formed by chance, but there's a series of events which have created it. And that is what I would call a causal genetic code. And that is the thing that really kickstart life because you're in this set of adjacent um, spaces. It's really hard to get your head around. So what am I saying? I've just contradicted my, my life detector. I said, oh, a molecule in a, in a, in a, in a piece, of, you know, piece of gunk in a crystal replicating itself in another crystal, another crystal is a, is a, can have a assemb high assembly number. Therefore, Lee, I've caught you out. That, you say that's a lie. That life does that. And I'll say, you see that crystal with that molecule that's made itself in that crystal and a bit of genetic information? That is a minimal life form. That is selection. So what, I, so what I'm now saying is like, whoa, assembly theory and counting the numbers of molecule parts isn't just about you're alive or not. It identifies selection. That, so assembly theory is a selection detector. It's not a life detector. It's a selection detector. But the more selection, the, the more, li more likely you have life. And that was a mind-blowing moment that I kind of realized just a few weeks ago after you know, um, lots of toil. So I said a lot there, but I think I've kind of addressed your question. And, what I, and I think it's really important because that selection then gives rise to higher levels. And in the end, abstraction and consciousness. And we now have a history of events. We don't have free will entirely, but we are shaped by our past, which is complex. And our future, what you're going to do next, what I'm going to do next, no one can know because we have all this internal structure and we're reading out. And it's almost like two unwritten books with two red parts. The environment is one set of chapters that are reading you and you're writing it and you're the other half. And when you get together, you have a series of, you then have the decision, you basically know what decisions to make. I don't know if that makes sense. Sorry for the very long explanation. No, no, I think this is interesting. Um, I wonder if, so when we think about selection, um, I'm going to try and talk about it without, without using the word in its own definition. But, but by definition, uh, when there's a selection process, right, you've resolved a set of many possibilities into just one. Yes. And that seems closely related to just the basic concept of information encoding, right? It's a resolution yes. of different possibilities into one. Can you maybe connect the dots there for people? And we maybe should have done this earlier, but can you just define information from an information theory perspective for yeah. those who don't have that background? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a there's we're in this horrible situation with information that we keep misusing it. So there's a there's a, a perfect triangle, I think, where we have a assembly. Entropy and information. So let's take this all in one. Let's take the easy one, entropy. Entropy just basically tells me um, the amount of disorder in the system or conversely, the amount of order. It tells me, you know, um, the amount of flux and stuff that's going on. Entropy is kind of like almost viewed as evidence of a power source. In fact, entropy is just telling us that time exists and we don't need entropy in the end, but that's heretical, will get me fired and physicists out of jobs and all sorts. But entropy is kind of a fake term that we've used to cope with the fact that we have time and we add time on. But don't worry about that. Entropy is very useful. So stat mechanics. So now information. Information, what is it? So information, put simply, there are a number of definitions, but information is a thing that I can tell you Okay, so I can give you a, a, some um, some 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 something I know, which when you are encounter that same circumstance, you can act differently. So let's just say I say, hey Nick, that you're traveling to I don't know a certain town. It's very busy, so don't go with your car. Go on foot. Park your car outside. So you could have done two things. You could have said, well, I'm going to just, I'm, I don't know that information. I'm just going to go and get stuck in a traffic jam. Or, oh, I know this. I'm going to park outside and now I can walk freely to wherever I want. That is a piece of information allowed you to act differently. So information is causal. Okay. But put a bit more, a bit more generically, if you take the Shannon 
electrical engineering and coding, information basically says, hey, um, um, you're playing poker with me. I've just dealt you four aces or three aces. The chances that your four players around or the other players around you have an ace, you know, because you have three aces, that you have reduced your uncertainty in that. So information is really at its core about reduction of uncertainty. So that's a very important thing to have. But the problem of information in our universe, without living things, there's no information. That's really kind of messed up what I mean by that. Well, if there's no living stuff, there's no encoding, there's no decoding. So I can't tell you something. So that's why the assembly is lower, is more primal, more fundamental than information because assembly is in the causal chain and then assembly allows you to build life and build objects and then we can communicate and then this phenomenon information kicks in what the problem we have right now is physicists are using information theory built for communicators to look at origin of life and systems and it's not fit for purpose because it's meant for something else so you have to put yourself in the causal chain, then you get assembly theory. When you're above the causal chain, you are information theory. Well, this is definitely the first podcast conversation where I want to listen to this one twice after we're done, once in a sober state of mind and once not. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you have any non-technical artifacts like a book or anything that you've written that, that people might go to if they're unfamiliar with your work so far. Non-technical artifacts. No, I'm not very poor at that. I, I do have a, I do, um, I suppose there are a whole variety of other podcasts out there. There is also um, some uh, kind of videos as Inorganica, which was made many years ago, which is fairly embarrassing, but fairly descriptive about what I was trying to do in terms of looking for life. Um, and there's also, I suppose, um, uh, you know, a, a quite a long set of conversations I've been having in the public domain with people on Twitter, on blogs, increasingly on Clubhouse about these concepts. I am starting to write more generally. Now I understand how to put it in such a way that um, um... sorry, you can no cut worries. that. It's my son. I should have texted them to say, hang on one second, that I'm, um, that I'm, uh. right, come back again. Um, so I'm, I'm talking on, I'm doing increasingly lots of discussions on blogs, um, on Clubhouse. I'm starting to get to the point now I understand what I'm talking about in a more general sense. So I'm writing some more general texts. Um, I might even write a book or two one day. But right now, I'm just trying to get this triangle of ideas, like I said, in entropy information assembly, right? And then under understand all the way back that life is not a one-off. Life is driven by selection. Some Selection is a fundamental objective process that occurs in the universe. Selection is the way to get to information um, and abstraction. But it has to go through this process that we don't yet understand. And that is a really fascinating because we're just at the beginning, right? I don't have all the answers. In fact, I don't have any. I just have questions, but a more um, non-biased look. And by the way that I'm developing my theory, as I said at the beginning, is through experiment. The assembly theory, I just didn't dream up one day. I thought of the mass spec experiment and thought, oh, gosh, I can tell complex molecules, taxol, which is a complex drug made by a, a tree bark from a random molecule that I may, might find by accident dead on Mars. And when I realized those two things and I kept obsessing about it and said, well, maybe it could naturally occur, but, but maybe I could naturally you know, flick a coin and get 20 heads in a row. How long would it take for me to do that? And you could calculate it. So, oh, that's not probable. Now let me say I can twit, flick 20 heads in a row on demand Everyone would know I'm cheating. And when I realized that my colleagues, when they said, oh, maybe you could get 20 heads in a row, they realized that actually when they play that to themselves, that doesn't work. So I know the theory's right. And I think that what I've tried to do is to try to help NASA because the problem that we have going back to the origin of life is we have a series of arguments based on ego and narrative, a series of definitions 
based on ego and narrative and a series of of um, what is the most important way to look at it based on ego and narrative, right? I mean, of course, science is based on ego and narrative, but what I wanted to do is unify people. So I decided to do one thing is to take a leaf out of high energy physics. We have the standard model. That's a theory for matter, works brilliantly. Now with a standard model, we can calculate where we might find particles. So we do that. Now we can build a particle accelerator. You know what we went and did? We said, okay, given the standard model with our calculation and our experiment, we expect to see a peak here, here, and here. We went and did it and found it. We even found the pigs. So here's my idea. I have an idea that the origin of life or life in general requires assembly. I can calculate roughly how much assembly we need. So now I'm gonna go make a robot. And now I know roughly how long to look before I start seeing selection. So I build my robot doing starting random and it starts random and can feed itself. So it should get non-random over time. And at some point it should cross the threshold where I can detect assembly. And that will be the point at which we invent life in the lab, objectively, demonstratably. And that is so exciting because it will happen. Lee Cronin, I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks very much, Nick. It was a pleasure.